Strange, but true stories. Tales from the light side, the dark side, and the other side. I'm Steve White. May 18th, 1980, 8.32 a.m. Pacific Time. The ground beneath and around Mount St. Helens rumbled. An earthquake rattled the weakened north face of the mountain, creating havoc as it slid away. Moments later, the mountain exploded as molten rock and explosive gases blew upward. The result was the largest landslide ever recorded and devastation that had not been seen in a long time. An eruption column blasted 15 miles into the air, and ash was distributed across 11 states. Glaciers on the mountain melted, creating giant lahars, or giant debris-filled rivers of water, mud, and trees that spread 50 miles southwest. It was a catastrophic natural disaster with the release of 24 megatons of thermal energy, or nearly equal to 1,600 times the size of the atomic bomb released on Hiroshima. Nearly 60 people were killed as a direct result of the eruption, along with a tremendous amount of wildlife that had taken up residence on the mountain. There are estimations of 1,500 elk and 5,000 deer, along with numerous bears, salmon hatcheries destroyed, killing as many as 40,000 salmon as a direct or indirect result of the Mount St. Helens eruption. Along with that, there have been lingering reports of several Sasquatch possibly being among the dead creatures recovered as part of the cleanup effort, with a bigger effort to keep that news under wraps. Two weeks after the blast, men from the Army Corps of Engineers were dredging the Cowlitz River when they found the bodies of two Sasquatch in the sand along the banks. Military helicopters were tasked with carrying out the bodies of elk, deer, bear, and in this case, two Bigfoot corpses in large nets attached to the bottom. Typically, these bodies were taken to large pits where they were burned to prevent the spread of disease and contamination of rivers. One report to the Bigfoot Field Research Organization, shortened from here on out to BRFO, was submitted by Fred Bradshaw detailing what his father had seen as part of this cleanup effort. My father worked for Weyerhaeuser at Green Mountain, Washington, east of Vancouver. The site had security on their roads to check on the equipment and check closed areas to keep people out. My father was working the day Mount St. Helens blew up. He was at a meeting in Kelso. He was a supervisor at the time. My father was sent back to Green Mountain right away, but like most, he wasn't allowed to go very far because of the mudslide coming down the river. He did get to the town of Tootle on Highway 504 off I-5. He and his crew were placed at different spots to watch mud flow and, of course, help people get out of the blast zone after the major blow-up. He was sent to the area of Spirit Lake to keep people out. When the second major blow-up of the mountain happened, my father and the other guy with him reported in, and they got out of there. He was then placed in charge of the helicopter landing zone. It was his job to help keep people out of the landing zone and let aid crews in so they could care for the injured. Later, when all the people were out and the bodies were gone, the National Guard was brought in to clean up. They hauled dead animals out that they placed in piles, deer in one, elk in another, and so on. They were covered up with tarps, and they were later burned. But my father was placed in charge of one pile of dead that were covered, and no one was allowed to go near. Armed U.S. National Guard personnel were around this pile. This was on the day they were going to move this group of bodies. My father was very close to it. When the tarps were removed, he saw the creatures, these Sasquatch creatures, some badly burned and some not. They placed them in a net and lifted them into a truck and covered it over. My father asked one of the guardsmen what they were planning to do with them. The guy shrugged and said, study them, I suppose, or whatever. He didn't want to know. He said, it's like other things. You don't ask, and you keep your mouth shut. My father and the rest were debriefed. They were told to keep their mouths shut as to what they had seen, and then they were sent home. 
After that post was made public, another person came forward to add more to the story. I was a National Guardsman on the Mount St. Helens site, and this is the first time I have ever spoken about what I saw firsthand. I lived in Spokane, Washington, and was 24 at the time this all took place. I have read some of the other stories, and they only tell part of the story. I was placed on a special cleanup crew farther up the mountain. A large tent was set up, and it was guarded by armed soldiers. We were given a briefing by a one soldier who said that, after he spoke to us, we would forget about him and what he said at the end of the mission. That was strange, as we never dealt with anything like that before. Four guardsmen and I were told to follow a group of soldiers and not to speak to each other and to remain very quiet. We were told to get into a jeep and wait. We sat in that jeep for maybe a half hour. Eventually, another jeep arrived, carrying a civilian and another member of the military. The civilian was brought into the tent and he emerged a few minutes later, followed by a large, hairy creature. It looked like a large man, covered in fur, and the best way to describe it was like Beast from X-Men, only brown. The creature looked to have some burns and had a bandage on its arm. At first, we were afraid, but when it walked by, we could see its eyes, and it just looked very sad and somber. He climbed into the back of a pickup with the civilian, and the two were speaking in a weird language I had never heard. It would cough at times, too. We followed the truck to different areas. There were five stops in total. Each time we stopped, we were told to follow the civilian and the creature. Each time we followed them to rocky areas where there were caves, the creature would make a sound and then listen. At the first area, he made a sound and we all just waited in silence. After a few minutes, the creature looked at the civilian and then at the ground. The civilian at one point touched its shoulder and called for a canteen to give the creature a drink. The same thing happened at the next area, but this time there was a response to the sound. After a few minutes, two soldiers emerged from the cave, carrying a badly burned creature just like the one with the civilian. The creature bent down next to it and looked it over for several minutes. It then spoke softly with the civilian. It turned and walked back to the truck and we were told to follow as we were walking away. We heard a shot, and we knew it was one of the soldiers putting the creature out of its misery. There was no response at the third or fourth sight, but at the fifth, there was another return sound to the creature. This time it was different, and soldiers carried out a creature with a badly burned left leg. We were then ordered to all help get a very large stretcher from the truck, and help place the creature on it and carry it back to the truck. We then immediately returned to the base camp. The creature was carried into the tent while the other creature and the civilian communicated. We were ordered to stay in the jeep until we were to be debriefed. As the creature turned to walk into the tent, it looked at us and made a waving gesture with its hand. We took that as a thank you for what we had done. By the time we were ordered out of the jeep, we were all in shock. We were called over to an area to be debriefed, and it was just strange. I will never forget what was said, because it was just not what I was expecting. A high-ranking soldier said to us, Look, do you all really want an explanation? You saw what we were doing. These creatures live in these areas. They mean no harm and want to be left alone. Do you really want to do anything that may cause them trouble? They are like us in a lot of ways. If you need or want to talk about this, just wait about 30 years. By that time, there will likely be no reason to keep them a secret. We were then ordered back to the guard camp because they were breaking it up so nobody saw too much and knew everything that happened. We did not speak of it, and after a few months, I just took the attitude that these things live out there, and honestly, my life is no different because of it. I only bring it up now because people have been writing a lot about Mount St. Helens, and I believe that the whole story should be told. I will also say this, I like to camp and hike and have done so many times throughout the Northwest. 
Every time I would look for signs of these creatures, tracks, listen for sounds, I have never seen or heard anything like I did that day on Mount St. Helens. A little unbelievable, don't you think? Or is it? After that came another account from somebody claiming to be part of the cleanup effort. I was an airman in the Air Force in 1980. I was stationed at George Air Force Base in Victorville, California from the late 70s to the early 80s. We flew the wild weasels, or Air Force F-4s, that would go into a war area before it started, like the first Gulf War, at low level and pop up and then light up the ground to air defenses and then shoot missiles at the sites, letting the other aircraft get in. In 1980, we were shipped to train with the Canadian forces on Vancouver Island. We took a C-141 from George to Canada. Our C-141 had an in-flight emergency, though, and had to land at Travis Air Force Base in Northern California for repair. We were losing hydraulic fluid in one engine, and I saw the crewman come back and dump several cans of hydraulic fluid into the reservoir, and it just went back to zero. He had a parachute, and we didn't. That kind of made me nervous. But we later got back on our way and flew over St. Helens, right after it blew its top. Once we got to Vancouver Island, our officer in charge told us we would be there for longer than the two-week temporary duty assignment due to an emergency mission that they needed help on. We were all specialized airmen trained in different specialties in aircraft maintenance and repair, but we were soldiers first, and we did lots of other stuff whenever needed. We were bussed to the area around the south end of the island and were picked up on a strange naval ferry. I was never in the Navy, so I don't know anything about boats or anything like that, but our bus was tied down and delivered to the U.S. side, and we drove off. It was under cover of darkness, and it was typically cloudy and raining, and we continued our bus ride to the disaster area. We were given M-16s in one mag, which I found fascinating because most Air Force enlisted troops shoot a gun in basic training and then never see an M-16 again. We were also given ill-fitting green helmets marked guard. In the briefing, we were told we would be guards to special areas and told to check credentials and to only allow people in who had the correct credentials to the military tent areas that were set up in what looked to be the perimeter of the area affected by the eruption. We had no idea where we were. There were no towns or cities around where we were stationed, and when we arrived, we were 30 airmen completely and totally confused about what was going on. We slept in a tented area that was near where we worked. We had a mess tent next to the tent where we slept, and we didn't leave that area for a week or more. We were guarding areas that people moved into and out of with what looked like victims. The tents we guarded had a foyer area, and we couldn't see what was behind the second door. It was brightly lit, and you had to go through a couple of partitions to get to the main area of the tent. I assumed they were there to prevent peeping into the tents by the guards. It was very infrequent that anyone walked in or out, and we worked 12-hour shifts at night. We were used to working 12-hour shifts because this was just after the Iranian crisis, and we would go on alert every three weeks, work 12-hour shifts flying as many missions as we could, then have a day off. Then another alert and three more weeks of 12-hour shifts for three more weeks. We were told that if anyone tried to breach our area, to shoot. That never happened, or even came close to happening. This was funny to me because we were given one magazine, and I don't even know if the bullets were real or not. We were Air Force, not Marines. I knew more about a 5-iron than an M16, but nothing ever came up. The only time anyone came up to the area I was guarding only happened after midnight, and it looked to me like a doctor in a white lab coat with either a patient or victim who was wrapped in what looked like an overcoat and our night shift navy blue ski caps. You could never see the person who was being led into or out of the tents because they had their hands in the coats and were led into the tent by the arm. I think I was there for eight, nine days, and it was the most unusual thing I had ever experienced in the Air Force. One night when I was on guard duty, I noticed two of these people that were being escorted were very tall. 
unusually tall. And that's about the only thing I noticed, that they were just two really tall people. I was not in a position to see really how tall they were, but the person or the thing in the overcoat was at least a head higher than the doctor, if that's even what he was. Only the escort talked, and they only mentioned their last name and showed their badge. I don't know if they were army or civilian. The other thing I noticed was the escorted people were really wide, but I always assumed, at least until now, that it was the coats they were wearing. It was cold, and I also assumed we were at some kind of altitude. After that, we were given a debrief that we had helped a lot of people who were victims of the eruption. That's all we were told, that they were victims, and told we were not to mention this part of our TDY. After our last shift, and I don't know how long that was, but it was longer than a week, we were allowed to sleep, then shower the next morning, and we were given back our original Air Force uniforms. We were put back on the bus and taken back under cover of darkness to Vancouver Island and continued our TDY as if nothing happened. We did two more weeks of flying sorties with the Canadians, played and drank a ton of Labatt's Blue, and flew in our C-141 back to George Air Force Base. It was all a big mystery on what happened then, until I heard the story. And now it seems really similar. They must have really been short on personnel to use a bunch of Air Force kids as guards, or they thought nothing would ever happen. But that's the only time I ever pulled guard duty outside of basic training in San Antonio. This has been another strange but true story. We would like to give credit to the Phantoms and Monsters website for information used in this episode. Check out their website at phantomsandmonsters.com. So, what do you think? Was there a cover-up conducted by the U.S. military after the Mount St. Helens eruption? Were tests conducted on the Sasquatch bodies that were supposedly found there? Tell us what you thought of this episode in the comments below. Subscribe if you haven't already, and sign up for notifications to know when the next episode drops to the channel. Also, check out our website and like our Facebook and Instagram pages. Thanks for watching this episode. I'm Steve White. Until next time.